So it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and um, I participated in that. So we had a good, this was at the Race for the Cure the other weekend. We had a good time there. Um, and so I'm going to need your help at the end of the presentation today. I'm trying to decide what to wear for Halloween. So we have some options. So we'll come back to this at the end of the talk, and I'll, I'll ask for your help on what I should wear this uh, Halloween. Um, I wanted to mention that um, I've done some work on some uh, patient education video work, and our practice does a little bit. So these are some websites, uh, and we have a, I do have one on a brief one on breast cancer. I usually like to show a movie as part of my presentation, but I was instructed this year I shouldn't really do that. So um, this is a nice short film about a young girl with cancer in Anchorage, Alaska. And I've given you the link here. It's on Vimeo, and it's free. But I would, I would encourage you to take a look at that sometime. Very nice uh, short movie. Well, today, what I want to talk about is cancer genetics and essentially three things. Um, cancer genetics as a prognostic tool. So how are we using genetics now to determine breast cancer <coughs> recurrence risk? So what's the risk of a breast cancer coming back based on that cancer's genetics? Um, and then secondly, how do we use cancer genetics to look at therapy? So what are therapeutic tests and how can we incorporate that into treatment. And then lastly, a concept called um, next generation sequencing, which may kind of turn our whole medical approach on genetics around. And the overriding focus is how do we take these things and make them personal? So what is personalized medicine? What is personalized cancer treatment? Uh, so that's what I want to emphasize. Um, in my talk today. Well, what is cancer? Cancer is basically deregulated cellular proliferation. So somehow the cell loses its normal growth uh, signals. So when to grow, when to stop growing. And this is a slide that I made many years ago, and uh, it still applies today. It's very simplified in this diagram. There's a lot of different things that occur from outside the cell into the DNA. But those are all targets for prognosis as well as for treatment. Um, what is cancer genetics? Well, this is usually what I look at first. And uh, cancer genetics. But no, that's really, you can't find that. But I, I don't <laughs> um, so we have DNA. So DNA is the backbone of genetics. Um, we have 23 um, pairs of chromosomes, 22 uh, that we inherit from our mothers and fathers, and then the uh, sex-linked chromosome. And then we also have uh, mitochondria uh, DNA as well. So just to remind everybody about that. Um, we now know that there's about 3 billion base pairs of DNA in our genome. And 3% of that actually encodes for genes. Um, and of that, there's about 27,000 <coughs> genes in our DNA. We used to think that there was 100,000 genes, but they uh, whittled that down to about 27,000 that actually encode proteins that have function in our uh, system. We also have mitochondria genes, and I'm not going to talk about that today much except to say that that exists. Uh, those are targets if there's mutations in those genes that can cause disease. And there are treatments that target mutations in mitochondria genes. So probably hear more about that in the future. The mitochondria is transmitted in the egg, so it's all maternally inherited. So we can thank our moms for our mitochondria DNA. So in cancer genetics, there's two types of mutation events, um, essentially. We have somatic mutations and inherited mutations. And that's a little bit of a simplification, but for today's talk, that's kind of how I want to approach it. Um, so the somatic mutations are basically changes that occur during our lifetime. So we don't inherit those from our parents. Um, and so those are mutations that we think occur either by chance or from exposures. 
but which cause cancer and then cause that cancer to grow and metastasize. So those mutations are targets for treatment, and that would be an example of personalized medicine. If we take an individual tumor, we look at what mutations are in it, and then we apply prognosis and treatment to that set of mutations, that is an example of personalized medicine. And another way to look at that, this is from the chief medical officer of a company called Seattle Genetics, which uh, makes targeted therapies for cancer. It's basically trying to match the patient's tumor with the most optimal <coughs> therapy for that individual. And so some of the new cancer therapies that we're using now are antibodies to proteins to try to stop uh, cancer growth, antibody drug conjugates, which are popular now, and I'm going to uh, go over one of those a little bit later, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, where a lot of those are actually oral medicines, they're not intravenous. So we'll be seeing a lot more of these types of therapies in cancer in the future. Now, inherited mutations are different. So those actually are inherited from one of our parents or both of our parents, and uh, we have those from birth. So uh, those can be autosomal dominant, they can be recessive or sex-linked. And in cancer, the common ones are autosomal dominant syndromes, such as the breast cancer, hereditary syndrome, and we have colon cancer syndromes and others. Now, the next generation sequencing, which is basically technology that allows very rapid sequencing of large parts of DNA, may at some point in the future allow us to look for every single mutation that a person has in their DNA. What we're going to do with that information, we don't know yet, but that may not be too far from the future. And we believe that cancer is a multi-step process, especially epithelial cancer. So we've known about the histology for a long time, so we can look at the tissue, sorry. Uh, we can look at the tissue, and we can see that it changes under the microscope from normal epithelial tissue to pre-cancer, invasive cancer, and metastasis. But we're now understanding the molecular basis behind that histological change. And it's the molecular changes where we're going to really be able to target what's going on and develop treatments specifically to those molecular changes. So let's uh, now, with that background, talk a little bit more about breast cancer genetics. Now traditionally, when we look at prognostic aspects of breast cancer, we've used histology, we've used what the cancer looks like, uh, when we get surgically removed. So we would use tumor, tumor size, lymph node status, estrogen, estrogen or progesterone receptors to try to figure out, based on those numbers, who needs chemo, who doesn't need chemo, uh, what is the risk of recurrence at five or 10 years, um, how curable is that person. So we did that for a long time. But then lately, um, we asked, well, Maybe we're over-treating patients using that information. So the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which is an organization of um, universities throughout the country that makes standard recommendations for cancer treatment, said, well, maybe we're over-treating breast cancer patients. Too many of them are getting chemotherapy. Is there some way we can figure out who really needs the chemotherapy and who doesn't? So that's where yeah, we said, is there a better way? Yes, there is a better way. <laughs> so and I'm going to tell you about it. Um, so this is predict predictive genetic tests. And the one that we use now is uh, one named Oncotype DX. And you might have heard about that or used it yourselves. But we're trying to identify recurrence risk based on the genetic profile of the tumor rather than the tumor size and some of those things. And that is an example of personalized medicine. So this paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, I think in 2004. And this was this 21 gene assay to predict <coughs> cancer recurrence in breast cancer patients. This test is now commercially available, and we can order it on our patients. And what it is, it's a set of 21 gene expression that they use in a uh, 
in a formula to determine is a patient at high risk, intermediate risk, or low risk of their breast cancer coming back. They have to be uh, estrogen receptor positive tumors and lymph node negative tumors. But this gives us one additional step that we can take to try to determine a person's prognosis and therefore try to develop a better um, treatment whether they really need chemotherapy or not. So this test is allowing us to take a group of patients that we would normally recommend chemotherapy for and take them out of that group and say, no, your risk is lower, you don't need chemotherapy to improve your survival. There are other tests being developed as well. There are some using molecular profiling. So researchers that look at breast cancers and just look at hundreds of mutations, thousands of mutations, have been able to kind of characterize breast cancer into four different categories based on those groupings of uh, particular genes. And they're listed here, luminal A, luminal B, HER2, and basal. So luminal A breast cancers tend to be the estrogen positive breast cancers. So they have a good prognosis. Luminal B is estrogen positive, but not as good a prognosis as luminal A. HER2 are those tumors that overexpress the protein HER2. We have a drug that treats that now called Herceptin, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then basal are the very aggressive breast cancers. So the basals have the worst prognosis. They're estrogen negative, they're progesterone <coughs> negative, and they're HER2 negative. We don't really know the best therapy for this group of cancers at this time. And here's another um, predictive molecular test called Mammoprint, um, and they also refer to it as a symphony, but this one is also now commercially available. And in this test, the scientists looked at 70 different genes that they picked by the molecular profiling to predict a breast cancer risk of high or low um, based on the molecular findings. Now again, this test is used for estrogen positive, lymph node negative as the best predictor, although they say you can use it in lymph node or in estrogen negative patients and lymph node positive. This was a test developed in Europe, so in the US we didn't use it much, but now it can be done on, off of uh, paraffin fixed tissues, formalin fixed tissues, so this one is now available here in the US. And these tests are um, approved, and the 21 gene assay, the Oncotype DX, is listed in the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, so if you have a hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer that is also um, lymph gland negative or just uh, micrometastatic, then you can use the 21 gene assay in your decision algorithm to decide do they need endocrine therapy and chemotherapy either or. So you can see here if you have the 21 gene assay and it turns out to be a high recurrence score, which would be a high risk of recurrence at 10 years then they would recommend that these people get endocrine therapy, such as tamoxifen, but also chemotherapy. Um, if it's a low recurrence score, then you can skip the chemotherapy. And I think the real benefit of this test is to try to move more people into the category where they don't really need the chemotherapy as part of their adjuvant therapy. Any questions about that at all? What percentage of them are low? You know, uh, so the question is what percentage are low risk? And uh, about 50% come back as low risk, 25% come back as, about, as intermediate, and 25% high. Uh, so that has been useful in the clinical treatment of patients for us in our clinical decision making. The intermediate risk, we don't really know what to do with right now. There is a trial going on for that. But, um, but studies have shown that oncologists do take that information and appropriately not give chemotherapy to the low risk patients. So let's switch now and talk about um, the therapeutic part of it. So how do we use genetic tests to pick out the optimal therapy for patients? And again, this is also a personalized medicine type of approach. 
So the landmark finding in this area of breast cancer is Herceptin. So Herceptin is a drug that can be given to patients that are positive for the HER2 protein. Um, Herceptin is a monoclonal antibody and it binds to the HER2 protein. So this is the cell and the HER2 protein sits across the cell membrane. It has a light band, the epidermal growth factor. And this normally would come in and bind to this protein and then make that cell grow. So, or spread, or uh, not, not what you want with your cancer. Uh, so Herceptin will come in here, block this ligand binding, and by doing that, it somehow causes the cell to die, or at least to not grow, and, and improve the results in your breast cancer treatment. So that was a landmark finding, actually, for the treatment of breast cancer. This is, this is data from a recent um, study where they looked at using Herceptin in the adjuvant setting, meaning that after breast cancer surgery and a person is disease free, if you give chemotherapy plus Herceptin in the blue compared to chemotherapy without Herceptin in the yellow. And this is uh, disease free survival and then this is overall survival. And you can see at about five years now follow up, that there's a significant benefit to giving the Herceptin in the HER2-positive patients. And it actually reduces the risk of recurrence back <coughs> to a cancer as if it didn't have the HER2. So, um, so now the standard of care if a person has HER2-positive disease is generally to also have Herceptin as part of the adjuvant therapy. Um, they're developing additional drugs, and there's a drug called TDM1. So this is now an antibody drug conjugate. So what this um, drug is doing is taking the Herceptin part of, of uh, this antibody, and then linking it to a cytotoxic drug called Mtansin, which then gets absorbed into the cell and kills the cell. So you have the antibody here, it has a linker, and then here's the toxic uh, drug that if it wasn't targeted or linked to this antibody, it would be too toxic for the system. So you couldn't, you couldn't just give this drug by itself, it would cause too much toxicity. But if you link it to trastuzumab or Herceptin, then it will just target those cells that overexpress HER2, so it kills the cancer cell, leaves the normal cell alone, and you have less side effects there. So this drug is not yet approved, it's in research studies, and it has shown high effectiveness in patients who have been previously treated with Herceptin. So in this case, these now are patients who have metastatic breast cancer. And for example, this category, for patients who highly express HER2, this was their response with the TDM1 compared to patients who don't express HER2. And there was also a recent study uh, reported where a trial called Amelia was comparing TDM1 to patients that got lapatinib and Zolota. So lapatinib is also a HER2 um, targeted drug, and Zolota is um, a regular chemo drug. Well, the TDM1 had a better response rate, better survival rate than the lapatinib and Zolota. So, and that, again, was in patients who have already failed treatment with Herceptin. So a very promising um, area of oncology drug development, taking an antibody and linking it to a cytotoxic toxic drug. And so I imagine the TDM1 will be approved pretty soon, and your patients will probably uh, will be a lot of demand for that drug in the metastatic setting. So that's the therapeutic part. Any questions about that? In the back. So the question is, how did the side effects of HER2 or Herceptin compare to regular chemotherapy drugs? And as you might expect, regular chemotherapy often goes in and damages DNA directly and is not very specific to different cells, whereas the Herceptin is going to target cells that have a lot of the HER2 protein. So the toxicity profiles are a lot different. So in Herceptin, if someone was just getting Herceptin by itself, they don't lose their hair, 
they don't have nausea or vomiting. Uh, it doesn't generally affect the blood counts very much, so they don't get a lot of myelosuppression. Um, it can affect the heart, so it can cause heart damage, so you have to keep track of that. Um, it can cause some diarrhea and that sort of thing, but generally it's very well tolerated. You can rarely have an allergic reaction because it is a uh, humanized monoclonal antibody. Um, but generally the patients tolerate it very well. Now it doesn't work too good just by itself, so it needs to be combined with some other drug generally. But that's where this TDM1 you know, may be an answer to that, where you're actually linking the cytotoxic drug to the antibody rather than giving them separately. And then you end up with less toxicity. So in our hereditary program, we've been at that for a long time. So I came here in 1997 and started that in conjunction with Dr. Riley and Dr. Edney and Dr. Carr. And uh, currently we have myself, Kathy Christensen is our, or is our nurse, and uh, Laura Krychek, our research assistant, and Hope Shipman is our genetic counselor. And that's our phone number. So we're happy to see anybody who is interested about a hereditary um, process. And Dr. Lynch was, he was my mentor, so I have to show this picture. Um, but interestingly, you know, nowadays we're all about personalized stuff. Um, like I have this pink tie. No, um, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're trying to get more specific with our diagnosis and our treatments. And Dr. Lynch, he recognized that way back in the 70s. This is a paper from the 1970s where he put a pedigree of a family here. So these are three different generations. It circles with the white fill in our women who've, who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. But, so he knew that if you saw a pedigree like this, something was going on. Uh, there, this, this cancer had something more than just exposure or something more than just estrogen causing it. So he recognized that in the 70s. And then he also recognized that if you have a family like that, you have to start screening early. You can't start at age 50 or age 40. You have to start at age 20. Um, and so he recognized that back then, kind of doing personalized medicine. And now we're doing that a lot more today. I don't know who that is. <laughs> um, so in our prevention clinic, we kept track of how many referrals we've had. So this is the number of referrals um, by year, starting in 1998 and going to 2011. And over time, we've got more and more referrals. I think lately, things have kind of fallen off a little bit. Most likely because I think a lot of physicians are doing the genetic assessment for hereditary syndromes in their offices now. Um, so you don't necessarily have to come see us. We would like you to. But um, it's becoming more of a standard of care in medical practice. But the genetic tests keep increasing. So here's the genetic test. Again, the number here on the y-axis by year. And it was pretty slow in the early years. And then now has increased quite a bit and continues to increase. So I think what's happening there is that um, it's become more acceptable to undergo hereditary genetic testing. There's less risk of um, discrimination. Uh, insurance covers it now. Medicare covers that under the appropriate uh, conditions. So we are doing more genetic testing, which hopefully will give people uh, more of a sense of what their risks are and what preventive measures they need to take. And uh, in breast cancer, as I mentioned, it's the BRC1 and 2 genes that are the uh, genes that we test for um, there. And just to get back to the personalized health care, the government, our U U.S. government, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, they want us to do this stuff. They want us to do more personalized therapy, more gene-based personalized therapy. So uh, there's a big initiative there. So I think I'm getting close to my time. But So next generation sequencing is the last thing I wanted to talk about. And basically what that is doing is sequencing the entire DNA, all 23 chromosomes, all of our genes, and in a short period of time and for a small amount of money. Um, so a lot of places are doing that. It's still expensive, so 
for example, let's say we test for BRCA1 and 2 and we don't find a mutation. But yeah, we really think that this family could be hereditary. Well, you can do next generation sequencing, and this is a company called Andrew Genetics that is doing that, and we'll look for other genes that potentially could be a cause of hereditary breast cancer. So they will do all of these genes, um, look for mutations in a rapid fashion. The cost of, to do that is a, over $5,000, so it's not inexpensive. Um, but that cost is going to be coming down, and this sort of concept will be applying to not only breast cancer, but cancer and other just general medical conditions as well. So, does one size fit all? No, it doesn't. <laughs> so. so cancer, the way I look at it is, cancers are like snowflakes, okay? No two are exactly alike. And we are finally figuring that out. We're finally understanding that to predict a person's recurrence or predict their survival requires individualization of what their tumor is about. To find the best treatment also requires specific um, therapy, more targeted therapy for these patients. So now, what I need your help with is to help me with my costume for Halloween. So let so what I thought we'd do just well I just have you clap for the different outfit. So let's start with number four. Who thinks I should be wearing an afro for Halloween? How about number three, Dracula? Anybody in the room? Or number two, how about the mad scientist? Uh, or number one, the pink uh, outfit. Thank you, thank you very much.